My, um, <clears throat> my life's been a bit of a, I don't know, like a, a fairy tale, uh, like a, an episode of a soap. Because if you sat down and, and tried to write it all down, people would think you were making it up. People would think you were hoping to have a life like the one that I've had. <clears throat> you know, I was born in a, in a slum tenement in the outskirts of Glasgow, in a place called Cambus Line. And this really was a slum. I mean, you know, it was a one-bedroom uh, apartment, I suppose you'd call it, with an outside toilet, no central heating, uh, you know. And a thing that I think is probably um, only peculiar to Glasgow, I've never seen them anywhere else, a thing in the sitting room where your parents slept, uh, called a cavity bed, which is a kind of like a, a square hole in the wall with a mattress and, and some curtains on it. And that's where they slept with my younger sister. And I, I slept in the bedroom with my older brother. And I, so it was a pretty rough start in life. But great. I don't remember anything particularly bad about it. You know, a back garden was a, a kind of bombed out shelter. It was just this mess, this stagnant, you know, dank, horrible, stinking pools of water. But it was great fun. It was a great place to be, I thought, because I didn't know any better. Uh, my education <clears throat> was incredibly basic. Uh, you know, I, I, went to, um, I went to the local primary school. Where I, I think the only thing that I can remember there was that they had a piano. Because the only thing I was interested in was art, was drawing, painting, uh, and music. And um, they had a piano, but they wouldn't let you play it, which was... <laughs> Which I thought was brilliant education, really. You know, don't go near the musical instrument because you might be good at it. It was a time when all they taught you was what they called the three R's, which is reading, writing, arithmetic. You know, and that's it. Anything that didn't fit into that particular mould that they had made was left out, was kind of pushed into a corner because it, 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 was too, it was too much like hard work for them to try and figure out what to do with you. So it was easier to try and remould you as an individual and turn you into this kind of faceless, soulless character. I went to, um, after leaving primary school, with these words ringing in my ear, I have to tell you this, it's absolutely true. The only thing I can ever remember my final year in primary school when I was 11 was my old Victorian-esque cow of a teacher. <laughs> pulled me up in front of the entire class because it was at the time when the kind of Beatles were around. You know who the Beatles are, yeah? And they all had these kind of slightly long hair, which was quite, you know, unruly at the time. And I tried to grow a kind of fringe when I had hair. I tried to grow this fringe. And this old teacher of mine said, you're effeminate. You look effeminate, boy. And I thought, I should be really upset, but I didn't really know what effeminate meant. But I kind of subsequently found out it's the sort of thing that would scar you for life. You know, it's the sort of thing that would be completely and utterly illegal today. But this old woman said, you're effeminate, you don't fit here, you know, gave it this dreadful attitude because I, I, I didn't want to fit in with everyone else. I left to go to my, again, uh, local secondary school. But I wanted to go to an academy, I wanted to go to our equivalent of a grammar school, which was a kind of tough place to get into. And the only reason they let me into this school was I was rubbish at everything. But I had a high intellect. I had a high IQ. They did an IQ test on me and they thought, there's something in there, somewhere. And I went to this school because I thought it would make my parents proud. So I ended up going to this school and hating every minute of it because again, art and music. They wouldn't teach me music because I wasn't already grade three at the piano. I'd never touched the piano at this point. You know? They wouldn't teach me any more art than the eight periods of art that they'd give you per week. So I was very frustrated about the whole thing. I left when I was 15 with no qualifications whatsoever. And I went to engineering college for six months because that's, that was a good job. My father was a van driver all his life and probably hated every minute of it. But the job that I should have had, I suppose, for someone like me who wasn't academic, was to become a, an engineer, an apprentice, get an apprenticeship, you know, learn a skill of some description, because that skill would see you right through the rest of your life. 
and that that was absolutely de rigueur. That's how it was in those days. You would have a job for life, not anymore, unfortunately. So I, I went to this uh, uh, college and then uh, found myself getting a, an apprenticeship when I was 16. I went for an apprenticeship. 500 kids went for this job. Ten places there were to get into this engineering uh, apprenticeship. And I got one of the places, mainly because my mother's cousin worked there and pulled a few strings and got me in. <laughs> but it didn't matter. There I was, doing the thing. And all the time I was doing this, music was full. It was just consuming me. It was in my head. It was there all the time. I'd started learning to play guitar. We bought a book, which is quite a famous guitar book in its day. And it was called Bert Whedon's Play in a Day. And it's a lie. It took, me, it took me months to try and learn the first few chords on the guitar. But I stuck with it. So music was already, you know, deeply ingrained in what I was doing. All the way through the, the, the first couple of years of the apprenticeship, I was playing in a band. I was doing exactly what I wanted to do because I was passion-driven. I was passion-led. So I was playing at weekends. I was playing as often and as much as I possibly could because that apprenticeship for me was much more than the, the apprenticeship I was doing as an engineer. When I was 18, I had the opportunity to join my first band, the one where I had to change my name to get in. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I went along with a keyboard player friend of mine who wanted this job desperately to join this well-known band in Scotland. And I went along as his mate. Suffice to say, he didn't get the job, but they offered me a job as guitarist. So I had a big dilemma. What do I do? I've got this perfect job that my parents were so proud that I'd got. I was halfway through this apprenticeship. This job would keep me and my future family, you know, in a good lifestyle all our lives. How good was that? And here I was given the forbidden fruit, an opportunity to do what I really wanted to do. So I went to my parents and, uh, and I said, look, I've got this chance. What do you think? And my father was just devastated, you know, to think that I would leave this job that he would have loved to have had. But my mother, who was a wily old trout in her day, said, follow your heart, do what's right for you. And that was amazing, you know, to have this, this woman tell me to, to go out there and do something that was incredibly flaky, to say the least. To go and join a band and, and hope you're going to be successful in the music industry it was unheard of. So I did it. Much further down the line, I found myself in the band that I should have been in. I found myself in a band called Ultravox. Where just in the early 80s, when synthesizers started appearing, electronics had come along, computers had started kind of appearing in music. Um, and I, I managed to merge this kind of rock instrumentation thing together with all this wonderful technology, these lovely toys. And Ultravox were incredibly successful. Everything I ever wanted was there. You know, I'm traveling the world, I'm touring, I'm successful, I'm famous, you know. All the trimmings that came with, you know, being in a band. My daughter's over there, put your fingers in your ears. All the girls that kind of came with it, all of that stuff was fantastic, it was wonderful. Five years later, it wasn't enough. There was something missing. There was something not quite there. You know, I'd, I'd been given the keys to the kingdom, and the kingdom wasn't the right one. And I didn't know why. A friend of mine phoned me when I was doing a TV show up in the north of England, a rock program called The Tube. And his girlfriend at the time co-hosted the program. And I'd known both of them for years. And this guy who phoned up was a guy called Bob Geldof. And uh, he was speaking to Paula, his girlfriend. And he said, oh, let me speak to Midge. And I spoke to him on the phone. And he said, I've just seen the most horrific thing on television. I said, oh, yeah. He said, there's a famine in Ethiopia. This is 1984. And he said, there's millions of people dying and I want to do something about it. Will you help? And um, I'll be absolutely honest, my first thought was 
I can't. I've got a record to promote. I'm, I'm out. I'm busy. I'm on tour. I'm doing all me, 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 me stuff, you know. But there's something quite persuasive about Mr. Geldof. And nobody says no to him. And I was one of, one of the first of many who said, OK, yes, OK, right, let's meet up. Let's talk about this. Let's see what we can do. I hadn't seen any footage at this point. I didn't quite know what he was talking about. By the time we met up a couple of days later, this famine was everywhere. It was all over the news. You couldn't not know about it. So you've got to imagine this. It's particularly sad. Two musicians sitting together, both songwriters, trying to figure out what we could possibly do to generate some money to help alleviate some of the misery that was going on in Africa. It took us two or three hours to come to the conclusion that the only thing we're capable of doing was writing a song, <laughs> making a record. We thought, well, OK, well, if we make a Christmas record and we get a number one, so your number one right through Christmas, New Year and into January, so you can generate two, three times as much money as you would having a number one any other time of the year. So we were quite brutal about this. We thought, OK, we'll get all our mates, we'll get all our friends to come along and help us make this record. And if we get number one, we'll generate maybe £100,000. How cool would that be? That would be fantastic. So we did. Bob came to my studio. I, did, I just built a studio in the bottom of my garden. And um, he turned up with his guitar that had hardly any strings on it, that he'd obviously found in a skip somewhere. And Bob's <coughs> left-handed, but he plays a right-handed guitar, so it was kind of confusing. So he's playing this thing upside down with no strings. And he sings this song. Christmas time is good. I thought, that's great, Bob. What, what, play it again. And he did, and it was completely different. Every time he played it to me, it was completely different. He was obviously making it up as he kind of went along. <laughs> and I, I'd sent over a cassette. Cassette's a funny little thing. Taken. <laughs> I'd sent over a cassette of a recording I had made in my kitchen with a little keyboard, a little Casio keyboard. Da, 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 you know. And... Uh, he came in, we tried to glue these totally incompatible ideas together in my studio to try and make this, this song. While I was doing this, I played all the instruments on the record except for the drums. Bob was on my telephone phoning up all of our friends all over the world. They're all on tour, they're all in different parts of the world doing televisions, interviews, doing what pop stars do. And he ran up a massive telephone bill, I have to say, and me being Scottish, I wasn't particularly happy about that. <laughs> um, and he managed to pull all these people together. Now, here's a really strange bit, and I'm petrified still about this, is the fact that we took musicians' yeses verbatim. We just said, OK, fantastic, you'll be there, brilliant, it's happening on one day, we've got one day in the studio to do all the vocals, all the drums, and mix the record, 24 hours, you'll be there. And they all said, yes, I'll be there. We didn't speak to any adults. We didn't speak to, <laughs> we didn't speak to a manager or a record company. We were speaking to musicians who were pretty flaky at the best of times. There's a moment where Bob and I are standing outside the studio in West London, surrounded by a sea of cameras. Because at this point, this was big, big news. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Microphones in our faces and Bob and I standing outside this empty studio on a cold Sunday morning. And Bob leans over to me and says, if it's just the Boomtown Rats, which was his band, and Ultravox, my band, he says, well, f <laughs> it's going to be a rubbish record. And he was right. Everybody turned up, every single one of them. They all added their strength and their input to this record, which is amazing, absolutely amazing. We left the next morning. I went straight to bed. I'd been up all night doing this record, mixing it, finishing it. We sent a cassette to Radio 1, who played it, there and then. So I'm driving home, 8 o'clock in the morning, from a long night in the studio, this cassette's playing on the radio. And then they played it the next hour. They played it every hour on the hour. It had never been done before, from a cassette. So £100,000 
escalated. We got on Christmas number one. The record industry, who are notoriously shark-infested and tight, uh, gave up all their royalties. So did the retailers, so did the pressing plants. We had Fortnum and Masons phoning up, you know, saying, how does one sell, you know, recording discs? <laughs> like, Fortnum and Masons selling records. We had butchers selling records in their windows. We had people who just wanted to be part of this. It was, pheno it was a phenomenon. It was just ridiculous what, what happened. When the money started rolling in, and we, uh, we wanted to bypass a lot of the red tape that a lot of the agencies have to go through. We didn't want to be another agency. We wanted to get the money, get the goods, get it out there and alleviate some of the problems immediately. So we surrounded ourselves by people who knew. We took the information they gave us. We ended up buying high protein biscuits, uh, uh, you know, uh, Land Rovers, medication, uh, you know, all of this stuff. We borrowed a plane from uh, Mr. Khashoggi, uh, which sent the first initial aid out to Africa. Now, the way the media works is that by this point, the famine was becoming old news. Something else had happened, and cameras do that and look at what's happening over there now, or over here. We knew that we had to keep the focus, the people's focus, on what was happening in Africa. So one of us had to go out in the flight. I did. I went out with the, the first aid that we sent in a, in a cargo plane and I arrived in Addis Ababa, the capital of Ethiopia. And uh, I was very unprepared for kind of what I saw. It was just a city like any other city. And uh, they took me to a hotel to freshen up. And sitting around the pool of the hotel, there's people sitting having breakfast or cocktails or whatever it was. I can't even remember what time of day it was. Uh, and half an hour in a Land Rover, I was out and I was in an aid camp. And an aid camp, if you can imagine, if you've ever seen a movie of a, a World War II movie, you know, Prisoners of War, it looks a bit like that, except at the top of the fences, the barbed wire doesn't go in to stop people from getting out. It goes out to stop people from getting in. And that was a ma major, major realisation for me. That people would try and break in because that's where the food was. That's where the help was. It was unbelievable. I'd never seen anything like it before in my life. When I came away from Ethiopia, I vowed never to go back because I couldn't go back. I wasn't, I wasn't the type of person who was cut out to do that. But I did. I went back 20 years later. I went back <coughs> to see the difference that happened. The difference that Band-Aid and Live Aid had made. Oh yeah, in between that, we did Live Aid. Um, <laughs> it just, it was a phenomenon. I went back to save the children and I saw the difference. I met people who had been in the famine, who had lost everything, lost their families when they were children. And they were now teachers or doctors or in positions of power, you know, doing it for themselves, which is amazing, how it should be, you know. Um, bear in mind, this is a couple of people who were kind of invisible people, Bob and I, you know, we both had the same kind of background. Just remember that if you feel like that invisible person, if you feel like you have no place to go and you don't fit, you know, sometimes when those invisible people get together, they can be seen from a long, long, long way off. Sometimes when those quiet voices get together, they can be heard around the world. If you've got an opportunity to do that, and you have, you know, grab it, seize it. You know, this is your world. You know, take it back. Thank you. <laughs>